Well, hello and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Chris Singer and I'm the program coordinator for the Mid Valley STEM CTE Hub. Before we get started, a few technical notes and tips to help this presentation run smooth today. Uh, please set your screen to presenter mode. That's up in the upper right corner that says view as a little film icon next to it. Um, you could put on side to side, that, that's good. So you could still monitor chat and everything else. Um, we'll have everyone muted and please just shut off your cameras for now. Um, just so we can save bandwidth and keep things running smooth and eliminate the Zoom lag. Um, we'll have the chat open for you to put any questions you have at any time during the presentation. We'll gather those for a Q&A at the end. Uh, we also have a short survey we'll put in the chat. Please help us with feedback about this presentation. Um, okay, let's get started. I'm so excited to welcome you all to our STEM Week presentation today with Nate Conroy. For those of you who don't know us, the Mid Valley STEM CT Hub works here in Lynn and Benton counties to enhance and elevate STEM and CTE opportunities uh, for learners of all ages. We work with educators, students, families, business and industry and community organizations to bring folks together to solve problems, learn and have fun. We also get to work with amazing people like today's presenter. We're so fortunate to have Nate with us today. Nate Conroy was a teacher in Portland, Sherwood and rural Honduras before creating the STEM program Meter Hero. His interest in how technology and personal choices can help us better utilize natural resources comes from visiting his grandparents' farm near Klamath Falls, where there is often not enough water to go around. When not admiring the utility meters, Nate enjoys growing flowers as well as supporting the Portland Timbers and Thorns with his kids. Please welcome Nate Conroy. Hey everyone, thanks, thanks Chris. Um, special thank you to the Mid Valley STEM CTE Hub and, and for putting on STEM Week and having uh, just a ton of great presentations all this week. This is Metered Madness. My plan today is to talk to you a little bit about how I became a meter nerd and hopefully convince you to become one as well. In the process, we're gonna learn about some tricks and different ways that we can utilize the meters that are around us to um, reduce how much water and energy we use, uh, which helps out the environment, helps out uh, our families save some money, and uh, also helps us build uh, some STEM skills that we can use now and as we go on in our lives. So super excited to get started. Normally, I wish that we could be in person. This is a photo of me uh, as a teacher. So I love uh, being around people. And so we'll, we'll do our best today. Uh, I put on my lucky headband uh, to, to, it always pumps me up and always gets me excited. Maybe you have something like that as well. So um, let's go ahead and get going. So as Chris mentioned, I, I'm from Corvallis. Um, and I always think it's important to sort of talk about how, talk about our STEM interests and how we love math and science, but also to talk about, you know, things that we're interested in uh, outside of that. So for me, I love being from the Mid Willamette Valley. My interests, things that I'm into include things like rivers. Uh, this is a photo I took just the other day down at Irish Bend. It's a county park in Benton County. Maybe some of you have been there. I love rivers. I love thinking about how hydrology is able to shape the earth and also how all that water and the energy in the water, you know, has really shaped our communities. Obviously, if you think about Albany and Corvallis, they are communities that are, that are kind of based on the Willamette River, right? That's our history. So I find that really fascinating. And I also love growing flowers. This is a, this is an iris that I'm showing off that I grew just this spring. It's just right outside my house. I'm super proud of that. Right. And I love how flowers they're they, they come almost like from nothing, right? It's almost magic, right? But they're using the materials, the minerals, the soil, and then they create all of these shapes and, and, and uh, functionality that allows them to thrive. So I love flowers. And then maybe like some of you, uh, hopefully out there, I'm also a big fan of some of our local sports teams, including the Portland Thorns and the Portland Timbers soccer team. So maybe some of you have that interest as well. Um, for those of you interested, I'm, I'm a little curious about things that you're really into. Um, maybe as we talk, if you want to throw a few things into the chat about your interests, I'd love 
to know what those are as well. But as I mentioned before, my big passion has become around meters. So meters are, you, you, as you look at this, this little video here, you'll probably recognize some of these. Meters are what are used to measure our homes and our schools and maybe a place where we work, the water and energy we use. So this is a, a water meter here, right? It's measuring cubic feet of water that's passing through. These meters here that we're seeing, these are electricity meters. They're measuring electricity that's coming from those power poles into a building. And then next we're gonna see, this is a natural gas meter. So this is a meter where natural gas is coming in. It's maybe it's being used to heat water or heat up um, like the interior space or maybe even being used to cook something. And what I really love about meters is that actually as students, you can learn how to read them, how to get data from them, and then do really cool things that allow you to build a STEM skill. A lot of times in STEM careers, we do a lot with data and with graphs, and this is a way to kind of practice that skill, as well as learn ways to save water and energy. So as an example, I wanted to throw up a photo of one of my all-time favorite Meter Hero students. This is Jelson Nunez Castillo, and he was a junior when he did Meter Hero. He actually had a job where he worked at a tapas restaurant. And he convinced his boss to let him monitor the water use at a couple of the different tapas restaurants. And because he was, he was monitoring that data, this restaurant found some really interesting things. Normally, they just got a water bill and they just paid it because they figured that's how much water they used. And I don't know, you know, that kind of just, just pay that bill. And Jelson, by collecting data, showed them that one of their restaurants was using way more water than the other ones. And, and even despite the fact that, you know, like they're all going through the same weekend rush, you know, it should be about the same, but one was way higher. And he figured out that there was um, a practice going on at one of the restaurants where they were using a bunch of water to thaw out meat. Maybe you've seen that maybe at your house, or maybe that's something that you've seen before. And again, because of Jelson and his data, sleuthing, he, he found that out and was able to help the restaurant to, to save a bunch of water, save a bunch of money. So um, I love that example of a, of a student, right, on their own making a difference. So I'm curious, uh, in the chat, I'm wondering if you know where meters are located at your home, where you live. Maybe it's an apartment building, maybe it's a, maybe it's a kind of a single family house. Um, or think about your school, where are those meters? I want you to think for a second about where the meters might be. All right, now, as a bonus, if anybody's feeling like they uh, you know, need to stand up for a second, I will allow you to go and you've got two minutes to go find a meter and then you can upload it to this uh, Google Drive folder and we'll take a look a little later right, right uh, during this presentation. So see if you can't find your meter real quick. Thanks, Casey, for, for reposting that. For those of you sticking around, what, what, I, what we're gonna find is that oftentimes, it's interesting, meters are often located in similar places um, in certain areas. So for example, this photo of Jelson, he's looking at a water meter down in the basement. And the reason why it's in the basement is because this photo and Jelson are located in the Midwest. So lots of snow in the Midwest. So they put the water meters in the basement in order to help prevent freezing, um, right? Because water expands when it freezes. So they put them in the basement to help protect the meter. So Jelson had to go down to the basement to find his water meter. Around here in, in, in Oregon, our meters are generally located out by the street. There's a little box maybe you've seen, maybe you've even seen somebody come around. My person comes around early in the morning uh, on a little scooter, pops off, and, and then it has a little, has a device, right, which he can put near the meter, and then it actually will use technology to transfer your meter reading right into his device. So a lot of times our water meters are going to be out by the street in our area. And then gas and electricity meters, oftentimes are kind of along the side of the house. You might need to peel back a bush or something to see your meter, um, but they're there. All right. 
one really interesting thing we mentioned before that Jelson had tracked these meters in order to save water, um, right? Help reduce reduce waste, which is something that here in Oregon we know um, water is a precious resource, right? If 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 we have a low snowpack year, that can that can mean scarcity in terms of how much water we have because that water that's up there as snow flows off into reservoirs, and then we use it, you know, here in the valley to to grow things to um, you know, to use in our homes and in our businesses. And, and so that's an important reason to kind of save resources. But I think another important reason that oftentimes we don't think about is something called peak demand. And I just want to tell you about why this is another reason why you might get interested to kind of geek out on energy and water conservation. So if you think about peak demand, it's like a traffic jam or think about like rush hour, right? There's certain times, maybe you're up in Portland, maybe you're trying to cross the bridge between sort of North Albany and downtown Albany, right? And there's certain times of day where traffic backs up, right? There's a lot of people trying to use uh, sort of a, a limited amount of space. There's other times where, you know, like there's not many people and you can, you can just go right through. It's similar with the idea around peak demand. There are certain times of day when a lot of people are wanting to use energy, for example. And so if we, as, you know, as citizens, as people who, who care about their community, if we can avoid using energy or water during those peak times, maybe do it some other time, even that action of kind of shifting when we use these things can really help. So for example, I pulled this little image off of uh, the Pacific Power website, which is the energy, which is the, the electricity provider here where I am in Albany. They have a peak time during the summer of between 4 p.m. and 8 p.m. I want you to think for a second about you know, why that is. Why might there be extra demand during that time? All right, maybe you're thinking about things like people coming home from work. Maybe they're turning on lights that, that weren't, uh, you know, that were off during the day, starting to cook dinner. Yeah, I see cooking dinner, getting home from work. Uh, maybe turning on the laundry, right? Doing some dishes. Right, kind of peak demand. Maybe it, maybe it was kind of cold in the house, or it was hot in the house. It's summer, so they're turning on the air conditioning or turning on the heat. Right? So this is a peak usage time. So for you in the chat, again, I want this to be interactive. So think about it. Um, when think about your home. When do you think maybe your home uses? What time of day does your home maybe use a lot of energy or a lot of water? On the water side. Maybe especially if you have like a, a lawn that gets that has the water turn on, you know, early in the morning, oftentimes that might be kind of a peak time. But this is interesting, right? Think about if your home, if your home's water usage was was a graph for a day, when might it go up? When might it kind of go down, as in not much water being used, and then when might it spike again? All of that um, is actually really important to think about. So now let's talk about, I think I have four strategies that I want to tell you about. These are all strategies that you can do right now um, to help not only have fun tracking data and, and using your meters, but also to help, again, your family save water and energy, help out with that peak demand. So strategy number one is to find and fix leaks. Now over here, this is a pie chart right, showing all the ways that a typical home uses water indoors. Now, as you can see here, this kind of dark blue, so 12% on average of homes water use indoors is just leaks. That's just water that's just, it's not even doing anything, right? It's not serving a purpose, it's just being wasted. And there's a couple of tricks first to find these leaks. Now, one reason I love meters is most meters, they will have this little thing right here in this, for this meter, it's blue, and it spins as water passes through it. So this little bit of technology, if you try to shut off all the water in your house, right, you think no water is being used, and you go look at your meter, and that blue thing is still spinning, that means that you have a leak somewhere, right? Water is being used somewhere that you don't know about it. So this is a fun thing that you can do. If you see that spinning, try to, try to go find where that water is being used. You might look for things like puddles of water outside, right? That could maybe indicate that there's a leak underground. 
you might also go take uh, a listen near your toilets. Oftentimes in toilets, most toilets are, they have like a tank on them. And at the bottom is a little rubber stopper, right? And this stopper comes down after you flush the toilet. But guess what? These things can get a little offline or they can wear out over time and that can allow leaking to take place. So oftentimes if you have a toilet where maybe like you don't hear anything for a while and then all of a sudden it kind of turns on and it starts to fill itself back up, that can be an indicator that you're losing water there. Or if even just your, your toilet kind of sounds like it's like running all the time, you know, that might be an indication that you have a leak. You can even YouTube something where you can utilize um, a few drops of food coloring. And if you put drops in the tank above the toilet and then come back in 10 minutes and there's color in the bowl, that means that water is getting through. The cool thing is that to fix this leak, oftentimes it just means sort of repositioning this flapper, or you can get these flappers for like a couple bucks, you know, at Lowe's or Home Depot um, and save yourself a lot of money on leaks through toilets. Another thing on the energy side, oftentimes leaks are in the form of air, right? Air passing under a doorway or uh, passing next to a window. And again, these seem like little things, but actually if you think about it, like if, if every day, every hour, all year long, you're losing cold air or you're losing hot air out of that leak, it can really add up. We've had experience with a lot of students doing creative things to help seal those leaks, right? I mean, there's like uh, materials that you can buy, or we've had students do things like use one of those old pool toys, uh, those pool noodles, right? You can cut that and then use it under a door. Maybe it's a door to a garage or a door to outside. And that can provide a barrier to help prevent air leaks from, from driving up your utility costs, right? One cool thing as well is if you're doing this as you're looking at your meter, you can kind of even tell the difference between how much energy and water you're using before you fix the leak and then after. And that can make you feel good that you're really making a difference. All right, so in the chat, I want you to think about, think about where you live. Does this seem like a strategy that you could try and that might be a good fit at your home? Give me sort of a one if you think maybe it's not a good fit, a three if you think it might be an all right strategy to try, and maybe a five if you think that this might be a strategy that would be a really good fit for where you live. All right, I'm seeing a couple, I'm seeing a couple fives. Okay, good. Yeah. Remember, the reason I'm asking this question is because you uniquely know your home, right? Nobody knows your home better than you do. So some of these strategies are going to work really well where you live. Some of them, you know, maybe, maybe you've got a home that you kind of think doesn't have any leaks, or maybe you think that, you know, uh, that this might not be the best strategy for you. And that's okay. The point here is to find a strategy that you think is going to be the best fit for where you live. All right, here's strategy number two. Don't overheat or overcool. So I want to give you a couple examples, right? Um, we, we uh, water and energy do really important things for us at our homes, right? They help keep our food cold so it doesn't rot. They help keep us warm so we don't, we don't shiver the whole time that we're, that we're in our house. They, they, you know, allow us to have a hot shower or cook, you know, food. But oftentimes we're maybe actually overdoing it right? We're, we're cooling something more than we need to, or we're heating something up more than we need to. And again, that's sort of a form of, of waste, as in we don't need to do that. So we can actually save water and energy by, by getting it just right, by being really smart about exactly what we need. So a couple examples. One, a lot of times freezers and refrigerators have a setting where you can set how cold or how, how, um, yeah, how cold the freezer or refrigerator are. You can adjust that. So like, for example, if you, if you often have things in your refrigerator that maybe are getting frozen, sometimes that happens like with things that are way towards the back, you might don't turn it off, don't unplug your refrigerator, but you might adjust that, right? And, and do an experiment to see maybe that setting could be a little bit less cool and we'd still be able to preserve our food, but not need to use so much energy, keeping it like extra, extra cold. Another way really similar is with a thermostat. So your thermostat, this is the image over here, a thermostat is something that controls the temperature in, in your home. And there are different strategies 
to adjust that thermostat. For example, if you're leaving the home, you can turn it down a few degrees. If it's an extra you know, warm day, you can turn it down a few degrees. Um, and, and adjusting that thermostat, right? Even if it's one or two degrees can help save a lot of energy. And then one that I'm really interested in that I think is interesting that I didn't know about was a lot of times on our water heaters, right? Mine is in my garage, maybe yours is in a closet or somewhere else. There's a little setting on them where you can set how hot the water is maintained. Remember a water heater is like a big tank and then it keeps that water in there a certain temperature. And a lot of times you might have the water heater set to where it's keeping that water way hotter than you actually need, right? And then sometimes it actually, be, it actually be, can, can be a little dangerous, right? If you're keeping water so hot that if you turn on the faucet, maybe a, a baby brother, a baby sister, you know, that water can be so hot, it can actually, you know, burn them, right? So sometimes just by experimenting and turning that hot water down to, for example, 120 degrees, oftentimes that totally does the trick for most families in terms of giving them a nice hot shower or bath or doing the dishes correctly. Um, and you really don't need it to be set so high. So again, that's another nice way to save electricity if you have a natural, if you have a electric hot water heater or um, natural gas, if your water heater is hooked up with natural gas. All right, so this strategy, try not to overheat or overcool. Think about where you live. Uh, would this be a good fit or maybe not such a good fit? What do you think? Go ahead and answer in the chat. I'm looking over here at the chat, by the way. What do you think? Okay. All right. I'm seeing maybe an okay, some okay strategies. I'm seeing, I'm seeing a, um, a five a little bit, maybe something to do. Chris, I see your, your water heaters in, in your basement. That might be sort of an adventure trying to get down there, maybe take a flashlight or something and see if you can't find this little knob to, uh, to adjust the, the setting. All right, interesting. Strategy number three, sort of similar to strategy number two is use only what you need. So there's a couple of things here. First of all, uh, when it comes to outdoor watering, oftentimes we end up using more water than our lawns or maybe our plants actually need. And that can be solved by even things like um, making sure that you check the weather report before you water outside. In, in Oregon, you know, we're lucky, right, that we get a fair amount of rain, especially in, in sort of the early spring and kind of late fall. So those are times when you can actually save a lot of water by, by just uh, being aware of the forecast, right? Also, this image, we see that it looks like this big sprinkler is probably getting you know, maybe its aim could be a little bit more precise. So it's, so it's, so instead of watering the concrete, which, which, you know, doesn't need to grow, right? What concrete doesn't need water. If we're more precise with how we water, we can just make sure that all the water gets, you know, used by what we're intending it to get used for, like the grass. This next image you might be curious about, it turns out that a lot of the devices that we use around the house that plug into the wall, turns out that a lot of them, even when they're off, they are what are called energy vampires, right? They're vampires because they, they just like vampires suck blood, these devices, these appliances, even when they're off or in their in sleep mode, they're actually still pulling power. So again, maybe it's not a lot, but over time, every day for hours and hours and hours, you know, all year round, they're still pulling electricity. So one strategy is just to unplug things, right? If they're not in use, go ahead and, and unplug them. In a similar way with appliances, sometimes we can actually save a lot of electricity or natural gas or water by using a different setting. I know that my wife, who's, who's luckily not listening right now, but she's great, but she oftentimes will you know, just sort of use whatever the sort of maximum setting is on the clothes washer or on the dishwasher. And instead, if you maybe do an experiment where you try out, sometimes there's like something called like an eco mode, or in this case, in this image, this is somebody who's using the cold setting, right? So they're using cold water instead of hot water, which would have to be heated up 
again, by gas or electricity. If you experiment, sometimes you need those heavy duty settings or you need the warm water or you need to have the extended time with the dishwasher, but maybe you don't always need to, right? And sometimes you can save a lot of energy and water by uh, using a setting that is not so heavy on its use of water, electricity, or natural gas. So real quick, what do you think about strategy number three? Trying to look for ways that you use only what you need. Couple responses. Again, only you kind of know your home, so um, you know what's going to be best. I like this Energy Vampires one, for example, just because I think, right, it doesn't cost you any money to unplug something, and maybe that can maybe that can uh, that can help. Also, we do this with a lot of schools, and sometimes the number one thing that schools do is they often have like a computer lab or something where maybe a ton of computers are plugged in overnight. And one of the ways that students can help save energy at their school is they put in um, what are called uh, the, the power bars, power bars, not the ones that you eat, but you, you plug things into them, right? And you can um, turn them off, right? You just, just switch to turn everything off at night. Sometimes that can help out a lot. All right, here's strategy number four. This is my last, my last strategy to talk about. Almost more than anything, I would suggest as you're trying to use data and you're trying to save water and energy, I would recommend doing it together with other people, right? We know kind of like when we set goals to, I don't know, exercise more or um, be nicer or those kind of things, right? If you, if, you, if you let people know that you have that goal and if you uh, do it together with other people, you're gonna be more likely to be successful. So with this, what we've found to work really well is doing this as a part of a homeschool group or as a part of um, your class, where like with these students that were shown here, these are students who just last week submitted their final projects talking about how they uh, tracked data from their meters where they live and the things that they did, right? The, the success or the experiment that they ran to, to try to save water and energy. And this is really cool because then these students are able to to have a shared experience, right? They can, they can say to each other, oh yeah, I did that, or I had that same challenge. And this is something that we do a lot as engineers and scientists, as people in STEM, is that we work in teams so that we can learn from each other, so that we can encourage each other. And funny enough, so that we can even celebrate when things don't go as planned, and we can celebrate when things you know, do go as planned, right? So this is something that these students do here. Um, if you are, you know, part of a homeschool network or part of a school or whatever. And if you would like to join a community of other learners who are doing this, who are using their meters, who are looking at energy and water use and celebrating their experiments and their successes, um, let me know. My email is down there. We would love to um, help support you in that effort. All right. Uh, with that, I would like to, you know, open up to chat, uh, open up to, to anybody else if they wanna share experiences of, of um, finding their meter or uh, any reactions to today's presentation. I do have a few submissions of meters from the Albany area, so we can take a look at those. But um, Chris, Casey, any, any kind of uh, thoughts in the chat or anything you wanna say related to experiences? I question about yeah. um, how do you how do you feel about um like alternative sources of energy like using solar panels or maybe collecting rainwater or repurposing your gray water um do you find things like this help um you know conserve your energy and water great great question casey so so those things those uh, those are great. So ways of, of generating uh, electricity. There's so many exciting technologies that 
that are, you know, that are becoming more and more common, things like solar panels, even things like geothermal, right, which is where we, where we actually harvest heat that is underground, right, and use that heat to make electricity or use that heat to heat our homes. Those are wonderful. What's really interesting is that as we think about um, how much those cost, so how much does it cost to, to create a kilowatt hour of electricity or how much does it cost to create what they call therm is the is the unit we use for heat how much it costs to make those things versus how much it costs to save them it turns out that being more efficient with with what we use so in other words not having to use as much energy and water is always uh cheaper than um generating it so i love and you know uh, it's wonderful to be able to to, to generate electricity in um, in a renewable way, and and to you know and to find new sources of water, for example, through something like desalinization. Those are important, but for us to get there too, it's also um, it's actually something that we can do right away, and we can do a little bit less expensive is to just figure out how to be more efficient with what we do use. Great question. Thank you. There's a question in the chat here, Nate, from Robert. When these activities are discussed and done with middle and high school students, what kind of classes do you see as the best fit? Yeah, thanks, Robert. So we see, we see two common um, places of implementation. One is at the early middle school level, usually in science class where students are uh, learning, earth science, they're learning about natural resources and sort of how natural resources have shaped communities, um, human impacts on those, uh, Oregon, you know, and, and other uh, next generation science standards, states have some really aligned standards, again, related to human impacts, uh, where this gets implemented, usually as like a three to four week kind of curriculum enhancement that the teacher will utilize. Recently, we've also been doing a lot with uh, at the high school level. Um, Specifically at the high school level, there's environmental science classes, uh, whether that be a general class or even like an advanced placement environmental science course where, you know, maybe actually right now after students are in those courses are taking exams um, for advanced placement exams. And then after that, they have a few weeks still in school. And so this is a nice sort of culminating project that a lot of times teachers like to do at that level. All right, I'm gonna go ahead. If any more questions come into chat, let me know. Otherwise, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a look at some of our Albany specific meters that were shown that got uploaded. All right, so this is a meter. I think you, you can see my screen, right? With the meter, correct? All right, great, thanks, Chris. So this one here, this is, uh, this is a gas meter. You actually see this tank down here, which fills up with gas, and then it gets it gets filled up and then emptied, and that's what gets gets measured. What I think is kind of cool about gas meters is that most of them still use these dials, and if you look closely, these dials. This one spins this way, this one spins this way, so they spin in opposite directions, right? And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. There's gears in there, and those gears are turning against each other. Right, and so that creates those dials moving in, in different directions, right? But you can learn how to read these dials just like you sort of read a clock, and um, and uh, and learn how to read these these gas meters. Natural gas meters are also kind of interesting because you can hear them, right? Like when gas is being used in your home or in your school, you can actually hear that gas passing through. All right, let's take a look at another one. All right, so this one, this is a electricity meter. And this one, it's interesting, this one has multiple screens. So if you're gonna read this meter, one thing to be aware of is, is like which screen to take the reading off of. A few tips on that. Oftentimes the reading that you wanna take is the largest number. Sort of like with your car odometer, maybe you don't drive, but maybe you've seen your parents drive or you know someone drive a car. There's that number right in the middle of the dashboard, which is like how many miles your car has driven all time. 
And on your meter, you'll probably see flash a lot. The largest number will be the total amount of electricity that has passed through that meter and been used at your home. Most of the time too, there's gonna to be a little unit there. So if you look here, there's a K, W, and H. That stands for kilowatt hours. So that's another signal that this is the correct reading to take. <laughs> the last thing I'll tell you is that oftentimes another screen that pops up is the date, like is today's date. So today it would be like 05132021. So if you see if you see a number and you're like, oh, is this the number I should write down? You should think, is that today's date? And if it's <laughs> if it is today's date, you know, look for a different number. That's an electricity meter. All right, let's take a look at the last one. So this is another meter that we that's uh, in Albany. This one, you can see the dirt. This one is down in one of those little pits outside the home. Um, be careful that lid is kind of heavy. So just make sure as you're lifting it off, maybe with like a screwdriver, you know, just make sure that that your fingers aren't aren't down below it, whatever. Get a little help if you need to. And this one, this is a digital water meter. And you can actually see here's this cord that's connected to the meter and then there's a little receiver on top so that that person who's coming around to read the meters they can actually just like wave a a, a wand over it like wave a device and this meter reading will go right into their device so they don't have to open the lid of every single water meter in the city right um, some really smart stem person figured out okay how can we save all this time of like having to lift all these meters it's a little thing right making it a way that you don't have to lift the meter lift the lid but Turns out that just, you know, probably saves the city a ton of money and, you know, it makes the job even safer by having this device that communicates the data directly. This meter is measuring in cubic feet. So think about a foot by a foot by a foot, a, a cube of, of water. Other meters will measure in gallons or uh, if you're in Canada or in England or somewhere else in the world, you know, they'll measure in, in um, meters or cubic meters. So that's a water meter. Um, another something, something else from Robert. Go ahead, Chris. If you want to. Oh, go ahead. You can read it if you want. So I'm looking at it here, and again, I'll move this to my main screen so I don't have to. You don't have to see my side profile. So Robert says, in my statistics classes or during statistics units, I like to do a lot of real-world data visualizations and graphing. What are some typical ways to teach students to compile and present this type of data so that it's clear and easy to understand? All right, good. Yeah, great question. Um, so, so Robert, uh, you know, what we we created this program because we saw um, we saw. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop sharing. I'm gonna share my other screen here so that I can answer this question better. We saw that a lot of teachers would try to do this with like just Excel, right? Like having students input data. And the challenge a bit is just is that that works to some extent, but also if you have a lot of students or you have multiple classes, um, it, it can get a little cumbersome. Not impossible, but a little cumbersome. So the we, reason why we created this little bit of software was to make it easier for a teacher to have a class to, you know, securely, safely, right, like invite those students to be a part of the class, the students then enter the values that they see on their meter. Um, and then what the program does is it gives students a, we have students predict what their usage is going to be. So they end up, have, they have a prediction line. We then have them create a baseline set of data, right? So like, what does their normal usage look like? And then we have students start an experiment. So then another line gets created so that students can compare statistically the the data of their baseline normal usage with you know the effect of the stimulus the effect of the change that they tried to put in place um, so that's what that program does what's what i love about this sort of three-lined approach in terms of as a way to present students with statistics is that i think it it, it orients students around the inquiry process Right, it orients them around this idea that we are setting up a temporary experiment where we're going to try to isolate variables, and then we're going to try to measure, you know, measure the change. That's the way. That's the way we do it. 
um, there. Again, other ways to, to maybe do it with Excel or just have students, you know, plot by hand. Um, but the, the Meter Hero program was created to try to make this something that a little bit more accessible uh, for teachers who, you know, have a lot of students or, or as I say, or a homeschool group that maybe wants to connect with other students and, and sort of compare data. Great. Uh, any other questions or ideas, requests? Nate, we do a lot of after school pro programming or work with a lot of after schools programs. Yeah. What's up? <clears throat> you know, can you share an idea maybe that could incorporate some of this into an, an after school program where we're not seeing we might see, you know, the group I'm thinking about that I have, I see them twice a month, you know, but I'd love to introduce something like this to them. Yeah. So this, this photo of me teaching was actually at a boys and girls club. So this was a, a boys and girls club where we did sort of an initial, you know, we, 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 we did this with, um, this was a group of students who, uh, they were part of a STEM club and the STEM club didn't meet every day. And, but what they did is this meter, this is actually a big, big meter here, right? It's here at the bottom. This is at the Boys and Girls Club. So they decided to measure um, the, the usage at the Boys and Girls Club. And what was kind of nice is that, you know, they could, whenever we met, they could, they could input a little bit of data. Um, they could do this over the course of a longer, period of time, right, to be able to see like how the building's usage changed when it got colder or when it got warmer, right, when the heat came on, when the air conditioning came on, when, uh, you know, more water was used outside to, to water the landscaping. So, you know, kind of monitoring the building itself. And then also, you know, not all these students uh, had the ability or, you know, desire to track where they live but they could, they could do that, right? And, or, or in Jelson's case, right? Like he tracked um, a place where he was working. So the, the platform sort of designed to essentially allow empower students to track data and analyze data from, you know, from, from kind of wherever they, um, they can. Um, that's sort of the answer, answer to that. And then I think what's interesting is this, I remember one day in this class, uh, the students, you know, they were a little, they wanted to see the meter, you know, actually measuring current usage. So we had, uh, we had, we, we set our watches and we had some students go and look at the meter. And then we had some students go and flush certain toilets. <laughs> and we, we measured, we measured the actual consumption of these toilets that were flushing because they're kind of an older model and we had learned about efficiency. And so we wanted to actually, you know, measure like how much water does this toilet actually use, right? You can read about online, like how much it, how much it should use, how much it was designed to use, but what does it actually use, you know, after 30 years of being in this school building? So that's kind of a, as an example of something that we did. Oh, that's, that's cool. Yeah. I think there, like some of them have it even on their, like these commercial toilets and urinals and stuff, they actually say what the water usage will be. It'd be yeah. interesting to test that. Yep, 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 that's right. There's, well, so again, as like engineers and scientists, it's one thing to design something in a lab, right? And like, you kind of know what, how it performs in a lab, but then a part of our job is to analyze how things perform out with real users, right? And users don't always do things that we expect them to do in a lab setting. So you have to, so you actually have to measure things out in the field because, um, you know, that shows you like how they're actually performing. There's a few more questions in the chat for you, Nate. Um, how long have you been doing this and about how many students have you worked with during that time? And then do you ever have problems with assessing accessing meters with students that are in restricted areas like basements or maintenance areas? Totally, yeah, great question, Robert. So um, 
been doing been doing this uh, for for about four years now. Worked with um, probably nearing about a thousand students over the across the country. I started this in Wisconsin when I was getting my master's degree as a part of kind of getting ready to continue my teaching career um, in Wisconsin. So definitely this this one thing that we've done related to access. So there are this is the real world. So there are times when meters may not be accessible to students. For example, in a school, uh, we had a partnership with Powell Butte Elementary um, up in the Centennial School District in Portland. And we wanted to track their water use at school, but their water meter was way away from the building and it was down in like a big, big pit. So we couldn't, so we couldn't do that water meter, right? Um, or, uh, but at that school, their electricity meter and their natural gas meter were accessible, right? So sometimes if you can't do one type of meter, you can often do another type. Similarly, um, with some students, they might live in a, uh, like an apartment building. And sometimes that apartment building may only have one water meter for the entire apartment building. So in that case, those students often in a similar way, they will track the meters that they do have access to. Again, oftentimes the natural gas and the electricity meter are available outside, or those students will uh, track a meter where they work or volunteer, or you know, again, maybe at the school's meter, if that is accessible. We've also had experiences where the teacher will bring in images of their meter because the teacher sort of wants to experience what the students are experiencing. So this teacher will bring in uh, images of their meter and the students get a real kick out of analyzing and critiquing the water use of their teacher, as you might imagine. So um, again, kind of, you know, ideally, right, the students could, could measure uh, all the meters where they live, but, um, but that's not always possible and that's okay, right? We, we kind of do what we, we do what we can. Nate, I'd love you to share the story you told me um, a while ago about the students in, in Milwaukee and how the unit went for several weeks and how they continued to keep tracking. We, so one, one thing that was interesting, when, when we started this, there was this question about, like, will students really go down to their basement? You know, it's kind of dark and this is again this is in wisconsin it's cold it's dark and you know, boxes and shadows right? you know, will they really go down there and and look at their meter and track it and so we were doing this with a fifth grade classroom um, on the south side of milwaukee wisconsin primarily uh, latino students um, you know a lower income area and a teacher had said yep we're you know we finished up with the unit about a month ago and i, I went on to go take a look at uh, just some of the data that the students collected. And we actually found three or four students who were still collecting data. So I, I have an image of it I could pull up, but of a student who, for example, had continuously collected meter readings, again, gone down to the basement, written down, probably wrote down the meter reading and then entered it into the computer later, but wrote down meter readings for 120 days straight. So this student got really into you know, tracking their, their water use. And it became sort of just uh, one of these things that they were, they were into, right? Which is, which is ultimately the goal. Ultimately, the goal here is to demonstrate to students and to adults and to families that STEM data, you know, these are things that are around us and things that we can interact with. And um, so it's really exciting to see a student kind of leverage that little bit of technology there to, to get a better sense of their own, their own, uh, existence, their own connection to data and to STEM. Thanks, Nate. That's just one piece of the many things we've talked about that has really stuck with me is that um, we sometimes we put our, uh, you know, we're not going to be able to get kids to do this or we're not going to, we put our own kind of assumptions or we under, uh, you know, misest, misest, underestimate or whatever. Yeah. The fact that, you know, it could hook certain kids and, you know, and, and what it can do. So I love that story. Yeah. And I would say, you know, just, just this morning I was working on, um, you know, sort of a, a, I was writing up something about how there's a lot of research coming out right now on 
how the pandemic with all this at-home learning has made the challenge that a lot of families face related to you know paying their their you know, right families are financially strapped anyways but just you know uh, more energy is being used at home more water is being used at home than normally would be and so you know i think as stem educators um you know it's also it's also really important to to allow our students to kind of engage with the real world right and 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 students i think i think students are aware um oftentimes of of struggles or you know challenges that their community or maybe their family face and and i think something like this is an opportunity to empower students to you know to not sort of just compartmentalize school and stem as being apart from their real lives but actually to to see you know the connection right and hopefully again um, make a difference in the short term and then also help students see themselves as as potential folks who can utilize this interest and these skills you know, in a career. So um, one thing we're really excited about is that, you know, water and energy utilities, the, the folks that provide those resources, they're full of people, full of jobs, of people who do really interesting things using math and science and chemistry and physics, right, to make sure that our homes and communities have the water and energy that they need all the time. And so there's just tons of local uh, opportunities for students to to get into a STEM career that's really rewarding and uh, is challenging, but also you know makes a difference. So, yeah, great. Thanks for bringing that up, Chris. Yeah, thank you. Um, the irony of that last statement about all the careers and job is that uh, Lynn Benton Community College here just eliminated the waste <laughs> the the water <laughs> environmental technology program here, which is just like. Honestly, well, so so discouraging for me and for some of us over here. It's just um, I don't know what happened with that or how uh, that came about. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. I, I I know some of you know a lot of the um, I'm on calls almost every day with with utilities that are uh, talking about their their upcoming retirements and their workforce mm -hmm. and you know so and and especially a desire to reach. Uh, students from underrepresented communities, because those are the communities that the utilities really want to, you know, make sure that they serve um, yep. going forward. So, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, nice. Robert, I'd love to follow up and connect. Sounds like you've got some good experience and I'd love to learn more about your, your teaching oh, wow. situation. So, yeah. 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 And to piggyback on Robert's point earlier about statistics and Matt, like I, I think the one of the draws for this program for me is um, the connection to math and relating math to every day and the, the world around kids is a way to really, um, you know, if you tried to just do this in a classroom without having kids go to the meter and do some of the data collection themselves and they, it just wouldn't be the same, you know, they would might not see it as, you know, never going to do this or I can't do this, or um, what does this mean for me? That's what a lot of kids ask when it comes to wh when am I going to use this? Well, and I think just to build off that, maybe as a closing thing, what, what, what I hope to, to encourage teachers in general, but is around this idea too, of like allowing our students through STEM to embrace that principle of, of, you know, iteration and, and trying something and maybe you don't get it right the first time. So because this is real data, we had, I had a student, one of those students who, um, you know, presented, shared their experience a few weeks ago, they, they said that they were a little frustrated. We asked them, hey, was anything frustrating about this experience? And they said, one thing that was frustrating is that I did my experiment, but, but my water use still went up, right? It didn't, it didn't save water like they thought. And they said, but I realized that I think it was because my family washed the cars over the weekend and uh, you know, did a bunch of laundry. So in other words, they, they themselves, they said, you know, I, if I was to do this again, I need to do a better job of controlling my variables in the experiment so that I can really tell the effect of the change that I'm making is having. And so um, I would encourage us to do more STEM that allows students to, you know, kind of quote unquote fail, uh, but really learn from, from those experiences uh, rather than maybe, you know, kind of more, uh, more kind of cookie cutter um, projects where they succeed, but but maybe haven't had the chance 
to uh, you know learn from from adverse experiences. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Nate. Oh, We're you. just about about at time. Um, if we have anyone wants to unmute and ask a question, go for it. While we just about wrap up here, thank you so much. Really great presentation. Really great program. Would love to see it. Uh, taking place in our region at schools. Uh, can we can we throw your email into the chat in case? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Maybe yeah, you absolutely. and Robert can connect. Yeah, totally. Yeah, please. And and yeah, it's I'm really it's awesome to be so much of leadership in this area is happening in Oregon and in Washington and Idaho. And, you know, so um, certainly something that our region can be proud of in terms of being you know, working to be good, good stewards of these resources. And so anyways, yeah, it's great, Chris. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, everybody. Have